In this video lesson, we are going to begin our journey into the atom. Now, many scientists had ideas about what the atom is made of. But they were just ideas because nobody could actually see the atom. Well, we're going to learn in this video lesson exactly how magnetism and electricity gave us some ideas on what an atom may look like. So by the end of this video, you should be able to use your understanding of electricity and magnetism that you learned in previous lessons and videos and apply it to help us understand more about an atom. Our story on atomic theory starts with John Dalton, who once said, we might as well attempt to introduce a new planet into the solar system or to annihilate one already in existence as to create or destroy a particle of hydrogen. So he came up with the billiard ball model. So what is the billiard ball model? Well, there are certain things that he concluded in his billiard ball model. The first one is that all matter consists of tiny particles and the atom is a solid sphere. So the smallest particle would be this atom. Second, he said that atoms are indestructible and unchangeable. Third, he said, when elements react, their atoms combine in simple whole number ratios. Now, there was still a problem of Dalton's theories. That problem was, how do you explain bonding? Dalton's atomic theory became a cornerstone for modern atomic theory. This theory could explain the observations made by Dalton and other chemists, but... Their experiments did not provide any direct evidence that the atoms actually existed. At the end of the 19th century, there was still some doubt about whether all matter was made up of atoms. By the 1900s, experiments were providing more direct evidence. And this is where along comes the cathode ray tube and J.J. Thomson. With applications from electricity and magnetism, J.J. Thomson would expand on Dalton's theory, and he would even solve one of the problems of Dalton and find something called an electron. So how did he do that? He did that using a cathode ray tube. You may be asking, what is a cathode ray tube? Well, during the 1800s, scientists discovered that a high voltage connected to electrodes created a mysterious green beam. So what we do here is we have two electrodes. We have one solid one, and then another one over here that's separated with a hole in the middle. We connect the negative side of a power source to the solid one, and the positive side of the power source over here to the one with a hole in it. So we have two identical electro metals. Now once current started flowing, it would shoot a ray, and it would appear in a green light on a film. Now this was very curious to J.J. Thompson. So what he did was he took and connected two plates, giving one a positive and one a negative charge, and he noticed that this beam would deflect. The fact that this beam deflected means that, hey, this beam must be charged. So if this is charged, that means we have particles here that are most likely smaller than an atom. I want you to think about that. So now he's finding particles smaller than an atom. And they seem to be negatively charged too because it's attracted to the positive plate. Then he started thinking about magnetism. And he looked at it and he said, hey, wait a minute. If I have an electric charge moving, that should cause a magnetic field. So we brought a magnetic field and put the cathode through a magnetic field. And then he noticed something. We find that the charge here bent down. These two sections of this experiment are very important. First of all, by doing both of these, he was able to prove that this is, in fact, a charged particle. He was also able to show that this particle is, in fact, smaller than that of an atom. And since it's not quite these metallic atoms, it must come from the atoms there because we have something being released from these metals that is smaller and being shot out. And it's charged. But yet, the atoms themselves are neutral. So from this here, 
he was able to discover the electron. Now, to define more about the electron, Thomson did not have a way of measuring the mass of the electron, nor did he have a way of measuring the charge of an electron. But what he could do was find the charge to mass ratio of the electron. So how did he do that? Here is what he did. He first looked at our first experiment there where we had two electric plates and how the force of the electric plates bent my cathode ray tube in a certain direction. Then he looked at the force of the magnetic field and how the magnetic field bent my cathode ray in another direction. Now we know from previous lessons that the electrostatic force is equal to the charge multiplied by my electric field. We also know my magnetic force is equal to my charge multiplied by the velocity perpendicular to my magnetic field. So what he ended up doing was he superimposed those two fields to try and get this electron or the cathode ray to move through undeflected. So let's take a look at this electron here. If this electron is traveling at a speed to the right, what's going to end up happening is this electron is going to bend upwards towards the positive plate. It's going to come across like this and bend upwards to the positive plate because it's going to be repelled by the negative and attracted to the positive. Now, if I was to have this electron go through this magnetic field, we use our hand rolls here, and my magnetic field is going into the page, my electron is going to the right, and my force is going to be going down. So if we were to superimpose these in the same area, we could have this electron go through undeflected. Then that must mean my magnetic force must equal to my electrostatic force. So that would mean with substitution I could get my charge multiplied by my potential difference divided by my distance is equal to my charge multiplied by my perpendicular velocity multiplied by my magnetic field. Which then means my potential difference divided by my distance is equal to my velocity multiplied by my magnetic field. So with this here then, we could actually also solve for the velocity of the electron. So let's look at an example of how to solve for the velocity of an electron. So in this example, we have a beam of electrons passes undeflected through 0.5 Tesla magnetic field combined with a 0.5 kilonewtons per coulomb electric field. How fast are the electrons moving? So first of all, we know my magnetic field is equal to 0.50 Teslas. We know my electric field is equal to 500 Newtons per Coulomb. I know my charge, since it's an electron, is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 16 Coulombs. Now since we have a magnetic field and an electric field and my electrons are moving undeflected, we know that my electrostatic field must be equivalent or equal to my magnetic field. So we can say my charge multiplied by my electric field is equal to the charge multiplied by the perpendicular velocity multiplied by my magnetic field. Now I know here my charges cancel off, so I could rearrange this, so I end up getting my velocity is equal to my electric field divided by my magnetic field. So that's going to give me, we have 500 newtons per coulombs divided by 0.5 teslas, which gives me 1,000 meters per second is going to be my velocity. So now I have a little question for you. What would happen if the electron slowed down to 50 meters per second? I want you to pause the video and figure this out. Now if you said that if it slows down, the electric force would be greater than the magnetic force causing the electric force to deflect the electron in that force's direction, you would be correct. Because velocity only deals with my magnetic force. And if we decrease the velocity, we are then decreasing my magnetic force, which then makes it less than my electrostatic force. This is where Thomson is really brilliant. Once he figured out the velocity of the electrons, he made them go into another magnetic field, causing them to move in a circle. Here, he would measure the radius of a circle, and he was able to determine 
the charge to mass ratio of the electron. So basically, he said the magnetic force must be equal to the centripetal force, which means we have charge times the perpendicular velocity times the magnetic field is equal to the mass of the electron multiplied by the velocity squared divided by the radius. Then we could rearrange this and solve for velocity to get my charge multiplied by my magnetic field multiplied by the radius all divided by the mass. Now he could isolate for my charge to mass ratio. These are both of the unknowns. And he ended up getting my velocity divided by my magnetic field divided by the radius is equal to the charge to mass ratio. Now let's take a look at an example of how to do a calculation of this crucial point of how we discovered electrons and their charge to mass ratio. In this example we have a beam of electrons accelerating to a speed of 5.93 times 10 to the 5 meters per second and it's going perpendicular to a uniform 100 microteslas magnetic field directed into the page. They travel in a circular path with a radius of 3.37 centimeters. We want to now determine the charge to mass ratio of the electron. So the first thing I should do to understand what's happening is make a diagram. In this diagram I have an electron with a velocity that will always be perpendicular to my radius. And it's going to always, the velocity will always be the same magnitude, but it will be changing direction. So we do have an acceleration going inwards, which is my centripetal force, which in this case is going to be my magnetic force. Now, if we're using my hand rules, we know that I'm going to use my left hand because it's a negative charge. My thumb is going to follow the velocity and my fingers are going to point into the page, which will show us using our hand rule that our palms will be pointed down. If my electron was over here, I would angle my hand so my thumb still follows the velocity, which is tangential to the radius, and the palm of my hand is going to be pointed this way. So it's always going to be pointing to the center. So now we're going to look at hint two. In this case here, we're going to find the charge to mass ratio. We know my magnetic force is equal to my centripetal force. So I plug in my formula for magnetic force, which is the magnetic field, multiplied by my charge, multiplied by the perpendicular velocity, is equal to my mass of my electron, multiplied by the velocity squared, divided by my radius. We're going to cancel off my velocities, and then we're going to isolate for my unknowns, which is my charge and my mass, to get my charge to mass ratio. Once we have that, then we just plug in our variables. So when I plug in my variables for my charge to mass ratio, I'm going to get 5.93 times 10 to the 5 meters per second, all divided by 1 times 10 to the negative 4 teslas, and we have to di also divide by my radius, which will end up giving me a total of 1.76 times 10 to the 11 coulombs per kilogram. Now this is kind of important. Thompson generally found that electrons have a charge to mass ratio of times 10 to the 11 coulombs per kilogram. So to make sure you are getting more or less the correct answer, you should probably know that whenever you have a charge to mass ratio, it should most of the time end when you're dealing with an electron of times 10 to the 11 coulombs per kilogram. So now I want you to think, how could we make the radius of the circle bigger for an electron? A little hint is this here. So let's look at our formulas. For centripetal force is equal to my magnetic force. I want you to pause the video and see if you can answer this. One way to conceptualize this question is you could have taken this formula and rearranged it. So we end up getting my radius is equal to my mass multiplied by the velocity squared all over my charge multiplied by my velocity multiplied by my magnetic field. And you'll find these velocities cancel out. So I end up getting my radius is equal to my mass multiplied by my velocity all divided by my charge times my magnetic field. So in this case if we look at it, if I increase either the mass or the velocity we will increase my radius. If I decrease either my charge 
or my magnetic field, I will also increase my radius. Thompson's cathode two ray experiment in which he discovered the electron also helped him revise Dalton's model of an atom. We knew that most atoms were electrically neutral. So then, if there were electrons that were negative, the atoms must also contain some positive charge. Since no positive subatomic particles have been discovered yet, Thompson suggested the raisin bun model, where there are electrons embedded in blobs of massless positive charge, somewhat like the way raisins are embedded in a dough bun. So let's recap what we learned in this lesson. We started off with Dalton's model, and from there we had J.J. Thompson's cathode tube ray experiment, in which he used electric fields and magnetic fields to both find the velocity of an electron and the charge to mass ratio. From this, he was able to discover electrons that are being emitted from atoms, which then means there are charges and things smaller than an atom in the atom. This means that there must be two charges in an atom. So are these concepts that you must understand and be able to even make your own experiment to test.